Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure, pleasure to, to send out a, a, an important message from a, a large community around the power of open source and digital public goods for climate action. Uh, live from Charlotte's Sake here at COP27 um, and all the folks that are following us on, online. This is an extremely important uh, topic, ever more important as we move into the implementation of climate actions, but also on the accounting and accountability. Uh, the role of digital transformation is essential for us to achieve the Paris Agreement. So a lot of the topics that we'll cover today, I think will hopefully resonate to how central, um, not only not only the topic in general it is, but, but some of our panelists. My name is Martin Weinstein. I am the founder and executive director of the Open Earth Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization based in California, but with a planetary mindset. We work in the intersection of emerging technologies, open source, and the collaborations that need to happen to develop digital public infrastructure. And we particularly work at planetary scale and big picture projects. Things that if we try to do alone, we are bound to fail. So collaboration is one of the most important technologies that we also talk about. Um, and and I'll like to just say a couple of, of things about why we've decided to be an open source and nonprofit organization where we deal with like extremely big picture ideas um, and projects that are audacious, that are ambitious, but they are exactly the type of things that we need to be able to drive um, in, in, in this day and age. Um, one of the, our missions, in, in, in a simple way for us to describe it, is how do we design and build the operating system for Spaceship Earth? Um, as a collective, as a civilization, we now are faced with a challenge for Earth system management and Earth system resilience. That is a collective problem and one that we need to have a way to augment our human capacity to do that. This is beyond our, our, our individual corporate, uh, national, it has to be at the international level. And we've we've seen a couple of, of tendencies that really, uh, for us as an organization, um, motivated, motivated us to, to, to launch as, as an open source initiative, which is there's, there's a lot of very important technology in the world, uh, particularly in the private sector that's proprietary in nature, and there's very little transmission of that into UN level implementation. So we need to create a level of bridges. Um, the second part, which is very specific to a lot of the topics that are being negotiated here at this COP, is the concept of the global stock take. The Paris Agreement's heart, the pulse, is around accounting and accountability around pledges. That requires a massive integration of data and information and reconciliation to pledges, and understanding not just how countries are doing, um, also how is that representing itself in the atmosphere, and how a large group of non-state actors are also contributing to that. Um, so with, with that in mind, we, we realized that there was a lot of digital infrastructure that needed to be put in place. The sooner we were able to build that, the better and more effortless the next 35 years of tracking our, our road towards net zero would be. Um, and then we obviously realized that why open source is fundamental to this. One of the key aspects in our view is that in fact, one of the articles of the Paris Agreement is around technology transfer and implementation, capacity building, to be able to do better inventories, to be able to track emissions, mitigations, to be able to do effortless financing of that requires technology that can be designed and built in areas and then deployed somewhere else. And open source is, has an amazing capacity that in code itself is it can be copied and translated at zero marginal cost. And so we see a, a very important view for the role of the North to, to finance, to bring in a lot of the engineering efforts that can also be leveraged in the South. And the capacity building for that, for us to leapfrog into new ways of tracking emissions and mitigations. The other part of it is around collaboration. Open source allows things to be transparent and, uh, and groups to work together around that. 
in 2019, motivated by the opportunity of creating a, a participatory global stock pick, we launched the Open Climate Collaboration, and we got 19 um, universities around the world to work together on common code. And uh, a lot of friendships were built through the process, um, and a lot of new tools were, were developed through that. And for us, it was a great mechanism for our youth engagement as well. Um, the, the final thing that I'd like to say about why for us open source has been fundamental is this has to work for the public sector, it has to work for the private sector, it has to be able to drive logics around um, uh, implementation of, of regulation, but it also has to make sense for uh, the, our conventional businesses. So open source is almost like a pre-competitive layer. When we think about digital infrastructure, where we can, we can see companies that are competing at some level but can collaborate in another. One of the areas that we work very closely with is, is climate accounting. There's now almost like a plethora of carbon accounting SaaS platforms that are helping companies or cities measure their carbon footprint. But they often don't talk to each other. For them to talk to each other, we need common standards, common protocols, common infrastructure. So a lot of the work is, well, that is the digital public good that we need to build. And it's often a bit of a gray area who's going to finance it. Is it, is it going to be the, the companies that are using it? Is it going to be the governments that are also leveraging? And I think it's always going to be a little bit of both. Um, I'm super excited for the panel we have today because we've got representatives from the Global Digital Finance Alliance, from, from Linux and OS Climate, from the Hyperledger Climate Action SIG, and the British Columbia government, all groups that we actively collaborate. And I, I think that also represents the power of creating these alliances that are not about what each one, not just about what each one does, but the power of the collective where the total is more than the sum of the parts. We really think that open, open source and open digital infrastructure um, is a key component for that. If you're managing a fund and you have a portfolio of companies, there is probably a role of open source and digital infrastructure to make your portfolio companies to perform better as a collective. Because they so, will compete at some level, but there's something that needs to be able to, to be a glue that connects them. And, and as we move through the digital age into uh, a, a need for radical transparency, uh, this is for us uh, uh, something we're always excited to steward. Um, and it's not just around climate and accounting. We have programs around oceans and how to create digital environmental assets for better financing of oceans, as well as working with cities, particularly with the UNFCC's Global Innovation Hub, a virtual platform, fully open source, designed to create a marketplace between um, um, cities, solution providers, and financiers. That level of integration around a UNFCC project has to be able to also be open source for all these pieces to sort of connect and to have a level of transparency and security, which is often a myth that happens within open source. Um, it is actually a lot more secure because a lot of the people that use it are able to inspect it, and a lot of people that don't use it but know a lot about security can also inspect it, can also contribute. Um, those are just like some of the key things that I wanted to share about why, of course, we're Open Earth Foundation. It is, a, is part of, 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 our, of our mandate and it's part of our ethos, but really something that it's just not just at the technology level, it's really part of the social fabric, that collaboration that makes it possible. I look forward to the conversation and I'd love to, any of the next speakers to, to join up uh, here to, to the angle. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for um, having me here. I'm Nancy Norris. I work for the government of British Columbia in Canada. And uh, the project that I'm going to be talking about today is the Energy and Mines Digital Trust. This is a project that the British uh, Columbia government is piloting. The intersection between related to this panel, open source technology, that we are building uh, digital ledger technology, building and contributing to the open source uh, community, and then also piloting it for the use of um, uh, cl carbon accounting. In particular, for in British Columbia, we have climate legislation, uh, which um, um, 
ensures that large emitters have to uh, report annually on their emissions. So we're piloting the use of distributed ledger technology, which is using digital credentials uh, and mapping that to the existing regulatory reporting framework around uh, carbon accounting and um, uh, GHG reporting. Um, so, for the interest of this panel, uh, we are uh, thinking about and, and uh, really exploring how governments can contribute to open source code um, and the uh, the and at the same time use that code for um, a use case that has to do with uh, uh, GHG reporting. So, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say as well. And I'll pass it to the next speaker. Go ahead. Test, test. You guys hear me? Hey, uh, so my name is Sherwood Moore. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the Hyper Ledger Climate Action. Maybe Calvin said? Is that the Twitter? Yeah, thank you. Um, and so we are a network of, of uh, different subject matter experts, um, environmentalists. Um, obviously blockchain experts uh, who are developing open source solutions under Hyperledger uh, to develop different climate accounting solutions. Um, and so the example that I'll share with you is, is focused on the scope three issue. Um, distributed ledger technologies are particularly well suited for solving this area. Um, and so we find that that's a really interesting opportunity um, to use that to create a, a more open and, uh, marketplace for environmental data by bringing down the cost, by increasing accessibility, by increasing trust, uh, you have the ability to unlock, incentivize uh, the different levers that are out there, government regulation, consumer demand, uh, and um, the financial refinance. By allowing them to work together, you can shift the cost curve uh, for the adoption of decarbonization technologies, and so there's a really interesting opportunity there. Now, why open source? Well, supply chains are notoriously challenging uh, to take on. Uh, supply chain, you know, every, 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 every individual in the supply chain has to measure, report, and verify their emissions, in this case, in this case report them as well. Um, and so a supply chain, you know, it can be 50, it can be 500, it can be 5,000 individuals uh, across industry. So in order to tackle like, that magnitude of, of, of a problem, open source is really, I think, the only approach uh, to be able to accomplish the level of complexity by allowing everybody within the system uh, to help build and solve for their particular piece of the challenge. And so uh, Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation are particularly well suited, uh, being one of the largest and one of the oldest open source organizations on the planet. Um, and so, you know, we're excited to represent them, excited to move this work forward. Uh, excited to be here presenting with these great people here today. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Well, um, I'm a cousin of... Uh, Hyperledger, uh, or represented open source climate, um, OS climate, uh, is uh, an organization, um, a community of practice and action that is developing using the Linux Foundation uh, approach, community based open source, developing data and analytics for integrating climate uh, in finance and investment decisions by asset owners, asset managers, banks, insurance companies, and uh, ultimately large corporates, and also its service to financial regulators. Um, a lot of what you heard from Martin, uh, when Martin and I had our first conversation, it was like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, so, um, in fact, um, OS Climate originally in the first slide deck four years ago stood for Operating System for Climate. So we were thinking very much alike. Um, we we uh, distilled down from that very grand vision to focus on the needs of, um, of, of our current community, the core community, which includes, um, uh, for example, uh, Goldman Sachs, Allianz, um, uh, BNY Mellon, um, 
and um, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. So, you know, a community there of asset owners that made 20, you know, commitments to Net Zero by 2050 um, and 2020. 30, 2030 commitments without actually having the data and the tools that they needed to set their targets and implement them. A very, very bold move. It's one of the reasons why Allianz, which was a founding member of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, turned to OS Climate because they realized there was no way they could build that data and analytics solution alone. Um, that there was every reason to seek um, an approach that could act as a force multiplier, um, as, as a way to, to not reinvent the wheel and have every single member of the Asset Owner Alliance building exactly the same thing, um, and back to the notion of the pre-competitive layer, to identify and bring competitors into the room. So two of the first uh, founding members of OS Climate were Amazon and Microsoft, and you know, and, you know, and it was kind of uncomfortable in the beginning. But um, there was an understanding and a willingness that um, that um, cloud neutral, um, uh, uh, cloud agnostic was going to be a part of what we were doing. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, fast forwarding then to you know sort of what are we building uh, to serve those use case needs? So first is a data commons. Um, that's, think about it like a library of libraries. Um, that isn't one centralized location, but a federated model. Think about it like a hub and spoke with APIs that are bringing in data, including um, from um, the um, Open, uh, Open Earth Foundation. Um, and then um, that is, so that's not only um, an, an infrastructure that was built by Red Hat, uh, but um, also a data management func set of functionalities that's very important and where blockchain obviously is, is tremendously important for understanding the provenance of the data that is then being used in analytic tools for uh, end use decisions. Um, the, the three open source tools that our community have developed as their first out of the gate um, are for portfolio alignment, um, that work is led by Allianz uh, for uh, physical risk and resilience. That work is led by BNP Paribas and, uh, and then for um, transition scenario analysis, a major contribution by Airbus, which is focused initially in their work, of course, on the aerospace value chain, um, but will be built out um, in the months and, and, and years ahead to encompass um, other indu heavy industrials, for example, will be some of the first. Um, and uh, so I think that's probably enough background on uh, open source climate, OS climate, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Simon. I'm a Deputy De Executive Director of the Green Digital Finance Alliance. Uh, we are a Swiss-based nonprofit, originally uh, uh, spin-out from UNEP. Uh, we work, uh, as our name says, uh, with finance sector, uh, looking for ways uh, on the digital means to, to green finance. Uh, so we work with traditional finance, but also with the new digital finance players like Ant Group. Um, and at the same time, I mean, we're having both like some policy inputs uh, uh, work, uh, so research projects, but also working on market demonstration projects with our partners. And uh, as part of this work, um, we frequently come across uh, the challenges that, uh, yeah, even for the biggest organizations on earth, uh, cost is always like a, a reason like not to accelerate innovation as fast uh, as they could. And I think that is something like whether it's on the data side, whether it's on the software side, where there's a strong benefit uh, across topics, across impact themes, uh, where we see uh, it would be beneficial to actually create some better open source shared assets, uh, but basically something that reduces, uh, yeah, that basically removes the reasons not to innovate and not to uh, yeah, work on the real problems in the world. So keeping the introduction here short and uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. And 
that was also why one of the reasons why we joined the Cli uh, climate change coalition because yeah, wanting to connect really to a bigger network uh, where sharing is really at the at the core. So, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Digital Innovation and Digital Art for Climate Pavilion. Uh, my name is Miroslav Bolzer. I'm with the uh, International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges. It's um, a civil society organization accredited to the UN FCCC based in Austria. And uh, as a credit observer organization, we had the opportunity to request this space here because uh, in 2019, no, already uh, step back. Our aim is all of society engagement uh, in climate action. And we said there are three pillars one is culture, one is technology, and one is organizational innovation. And uh, in terms of technology, we've seen blockchain technology is really a game changer. Now so much more is possible in terms of uh, connecting the dots, connecting the stakeholders. And uh, at the um, COP25 in Madrid, we have formed the, the digital innovation community within the UNFCCC process. And it's the idea that if we work together, then we have the capacity to enable transformative change. And it's the same logic of open source, of uh, digital global public goods that uh, inspires us. We need to work together because we don't have time to lose for siloed applications or for institutional egoisms in this open source uh, global public goods framework thinking uh, uh, a lot is possible and we are happy uh, I was a strategic director of the Climate Change Coalition which is a network of 360 organizations and uh, co-founded by the UN Climate Change Secretary Masamba Thiouye uh, who is leading the Global Innovation Hub of the UNFCCC is uh, our co-founding uh, chair and uh, Tom Baumann, who unfortunately can't be here today with us, but uh, we are very happy to have you here. It's uh, such a great group of people who have own networks and uh, the invitation here from our side that we join forces and that we bring even uh, more prominently our solutions to the next COP, COP28. That's our strategy. There should be a digital innovation flagship initiative of the presidency so and the pavilion could be the the pavilion this year is somehow the incubation space for the idea and next year it should be the manifestation of the power of non-state actors because we digital solution providers and also the citizens that are empowered by digital solution we are not coming empty-handed we have so much to contribute uh, and um, we can together uh, succeed and help the national governments. They are trying, but they are not performing well, I would say. We need to help them, and thanks for today's event. It will be important and one of the steps towards success. <laughs> Um, our uh, original moderator, Luisa, is still stuck in the airport. Let me see if we can turn it on. So what, what I think we could do in the spirit of open source is have a bottom-up, self-organizing discussion on, of course, the power of open source and, um, and digital public goods for climate action. So some of the thoughts that I that I come up as we're, as we're hearing from everyone's perspective and, and I'm open to um, other ideas is there's, there's a couple of key points that connects all of our initiatives and a lot of our work and the collective message, message that we're trying to put out uh, at COP. One is the importance around infrastructure and that relates to architecture, uh, relates to how we decide what that our infrastructure and architecture should look like um, if you think about any form of infrastructure that we're used to, whether it's uh, pole lines for the electricity grid, how do we do that in the digital world? Uh, the communities of practice and expertise that have to gather around, 
The second thing is, of course, we're in the implementation cup. So there's a lot of, and I'm aware of this, abstractness when we talk about what we do for the normal world. Um, how do we explain it in a way that is grounding, that it actually is, is able to empower climate action in the context of, of real mitigations, of adaptation, of equity, um, and in the context not just of climate, but also biodiversity? Like, what can we talk about the projects and, and how what we've seen is translated on the ground? And the third thing that I think is very important, and, and I think most of us practitioners in the field understand is, open source tends to have a myth around like, it's free code, right? And, um, and, and, and if it's free code, like who, who pays for it? So there's, there's constantly, both with code and with data, how do we understand the evolution of business models for open source and for open data. I think there's a very interesting discussion to have at any of these three things or any other aspect, but because we're doing like bottom up, I'm interested in seeing like if that's a good way to, to start. Um, but I think it's probably interesting to hear from the anchor of the projects that each one is, is, is spearheading. Um, hoping to see if that resonates. Who wants to go first? So um, uh, I'll I'll take so just quickly summarize your three your three topics are like the architecture like how do we decide what needs to be built if we're if we're thinking about open source as sort of the solution for collective uh, intelligence around climate action around accounting and accountability yep. how does that happen uh, that's like the blueprint the second is how that's do we right. turn that into action yep and the third is like what's the business model around open source great. Cool. Let's yeah, do it. that sounds good. Uh, so actually, I, I'm going to do two and three. So. Oh. Uh, okay. um, well, I'll just speak to uh, the architecture component. Um, you know, again, I mentioned that we're we're focused on um, scope three, um, and that market that marketplace. We're essentially we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, and I think that a lot of that gets done a lot of times. Um, so we're really focused on essentially developing a solution that can bring in different subject matter experts to do what they do best. So MRV, for example, is not something that, that we want to build. Uh, the data analytics is not something we want to build. Um, the, um, the, the digital assets for the, uh, for the financial industry is not something that we're particularly like, well suited to build. Um, but if you can essentially figure out the underlying infrastructure um, and, and provide value for the different players, um, uh, then, then I think you can be effective in developing a, 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 a system of value, right? Um, and so I think that the real trick is understanding, doing the legwork, doing the research, talking to people ahead of time to figure out who the players are, what the value exchange is, to understand what to build because um, yeah, the tendency is to start building, right? Um, and, um, and so that's you know, part of the reason we're here, uh, to figure out you know, what to build and what not to build. Um, I can continue. I mean, if we love to hear like your your approach in architecture, and I can sort of share a bit of what has been our experience as well. Um, briefly, in 2019, um, uh, I think it was COP COP 25. Um, we had the, the the vision that we needed an operating system for for climate for the global stock take, and so created a global hackathon and say like, hey, let's let's design it, let's architect it. It didn't work. It worked in so many ways, and it other didn't work in like how do you bring everyone together and try to bottom up architect something? It's very complex, very sophisticated, and and so one of the things we've learned is that the key components is first that you have to build communities, and I think this is something I learned a lot from the Linux Foundation, particularly um, Brian Bellendorf, former uh, director of of Hyperledger, who's been in the open source space forever. And um, it's the communities that self-attract the right people that are interested in the similar questions. And so every, they, they clearly identify as a stakeholder of that infrastructure. If you're a car manufacturer, you're interested in like the art infrastructure of highways and roads, and they'll just self-organize, say, we need roads, right? So that's the first thing that happens. But, but what I also learned is that it does require one group that is able to listen, that is able to start building something based on that and put it out in the open. And that is a level of leadership that is key. 
because without putting something that's already out in the open, it doesn't allow people to build something on top. It's very hard for people to start building on top of slides or Word documents. But when there's code, people start building on top of it. So those are just like the two things that I wanted to share from our short experience in like being like open source is the solution. It was like, uh, okay, there's a couple of things that need to happen. Thanks. For our project, uh, we're focusing on distributed ledger technology. And it, to your point, Martin, I think that it's so important um, to, because these technologies, oh, okay, yeah, because these technologies, there are so many use cases that they can enable. Uh, we're focusing on uh, the energy and mining sector, uh, but you know we have colleagues in the BC government who are fo focusing on individual identity and the use of digital credentials, similar to like if you have a driver's license, creating that as a digital credential that can be exchanged. Uh, for us, we have decided uh, to focus on um, it, processes that are have a regulatory underpinning within BC, within law, because we find that that, that actually uh, your governance framework is already established. You can point to it. And also, there's already a defined information exchange within uh, that is already happening. It might be happening via PDFs attached to emails or uh, web forms, but it, it is already taking place. So if we can use the technology that we're building to map those existing processes, uh, we find that, that um, it resonates for people, it makes it real, and it, it, to your point, it, we're building something, we're putting it out there that people can then um, engage with. Uh, and, um, and also, it, um, it shows the value of um, using technology and using advanced distributed ledger technology to, um, for businesses in British Columbia and elsewhere to um, uh, improve their business processes make it more efficient for them to do, for, in the case that we're talking about, GHG reporting. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. There's a, there's a, there's a fun story that I, that I heard through collaborating with, with BC that I think is worth sharing, which is you started focusing on like the identity of your citizens and then in corporates and put a lot of that code out there and then found out that the UN, uh, like the the CTO of the UN Pension Fund had taken, had found that project and reutilized. And now, if you're like a UN employee and there's a pension fund that you're associated, it's used this technology, and you didn't know about it because they just said, "Great, thank you. This is very useful for us." I think that's that's a that's a great example, and they probably started building on top of that. Um, yeah, and I'll just follow that up with saying that as a government, you know, we're not known for being particularly innovative or risk taking, but when you have those kind of examples, that validates the work that we're doing. And it, it, it allows us to continually you know, show our colleagues, uh, get funds directed towards this kind of work. Um, so open source is, is really quite incredible for that because you know, the fact that other governments are using the code that we've built and contributed, and then we have this amazing sort of uh, feedback loop from them about how the code's working for them. They can contribute as well. It's just this continual refinement process. So to finish up uh, on the first. Got it. Okay. Uh, got it. Okay. So I'll finish up on the, the first question. So just to illustrate your point about the the importance of architecture. So um, uh, Vincent Caldera, uh, who is the CTO for the Asia region for Red Hat, um, sort of came to the vision that we had in words and slides. A little louder. Okay. Great. So uh, Vincent Caldera, CTO of uh, Red Hat, came to the, the vision that we had you know, sort of uh, outlined in slides for a data commons um, and uh, said, if we start developers uh, on this without having a proper architecture, they'll go off and they'll create a white elephant. And, um, and, and then a year later, we'll be correcting, we'll be scrapping it and starting it all over. So um, uh, that just illustrates the importance of having 
um, uh, the community start with the architecture, um, create the kernel essentially, then build out from that. So that's that's part of what we've experienced in open source climate, and now you know are set for a very large community to take the next steps in building out the data comp. Um, to the second question that you had posed. Okay. To the second question. To the second question you had posed. Uh, so. Um, a lot of what we deal with in uh, sustainable finance that is in that realm of use cases for um, for asset owners, asset managers, banks, um, and, and regulators, there's a lot of methodology that's been written down in words. Uh, and what our community of practice is, is doing is translating those words into math, then into code, uh, and uh, through proofs of concept that then are transparently critiqued and improved. So that is just the simple process of going from a community of practice to action. Uh, yeah, no, it, it would be great to hear the second one was how do we take this broad eth ethereal concept of open source into like climate action It'd be great to, I know that de you definitely have a lot, a lot of concrete examples, but it would be great to hear uh, a couple of thoughts around that. Maybe also from the GDFA angle, there's, there's, there's very concrete things that you guys work on, like climate bonds and... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's probably quite, quite a few topics. I mean, like where, where we see it maybe also fitting at the moment is uh, when we're involved in some energy efficient mortgages uh, projects where the data that are sitting somewhere in silos, whether it's with utilities, uh, whether it's like with the individual uh, yeah, research institutes. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of this is actually not uh, even held like with a with a intention to to monetize it. Um, so, meaning also that uh, if you find a proper way how to actually put this into a an, into like a general pool where it's accessible to to all the ecosystem partners. Um, it can become also quite a yeah a good resource for collaboration where everyone chips in like with some assets and then yeah building building probably like also a layer on top how you actually yeah aggregate those data because at the moment um, yeah there's often like no standardization between the data and that is something that someone needs to do it but for each individual party it's it's uh, quite uh, cumbersome it's quite expensive um, and yeah, you need to create the structures to, to actually have individuals and pick up on projects, uh, yeah, the standardization work. Just one example, maybe. I just wanted to add on a quick um, specific instance of that um, methodology to math to code um, POC. So um, one of the great needs across the um, sustainable finance space is being able to deal with the truth of the present where you have all these different taxonomies and standards for disclosures um, and um, and even as the regulators are developing uh, mandatory um, uh, standards uh, you, you still have um, a problem where corporates are going to disclose generally in one standard how do those um, then translate across so um, uh, the uh, there's a fintech called Ureg, uh, based in uh, Singapore, um, that in collaboration with U uh, with uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore um, uh, I and NOS Climate is developing a proof of concept for something that is akin to a Rosetta Stone that can take a disclosure in one taxonomy and crosswalk it to another taxonomy, so that um, so that it's um, consistent and usable, uh, no matter which uh, um, taxonomy. Then, and uh, you know, a financial decision maker is applying. Um, it's for sure going to be wrong in its first output. Um, it's going to be tested, critiqued, improved, improved, improved um, with the greater the knowledge of the whole community. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say uh, just talking about the actual open source projects that we have, um, it's not just the development. Um, we have several uh, research projects 
um, that we've had you know, really interesting high caliber people who are working on now and, and some of projects that we finished. Um, yeah, and I also think uh, there's there's opportunity um, in potentially the um, just how to, how to kind of format data, some more of, of how the data is, is structured. Um, so there's just uh, it's pretty wide open. It's as far I think a pretty broad approach to to open source within 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 our group, um, and um, even to the point of you know, open sourcing some of the promotion work that we do. Um, there's just generally a, a lot of interest in becoming a part of the solution in this space, um, and there's just a lot of energy. So if you can think through how to kind of tap into that energy. Um, and allow people to use their skill sets, whether those are technical or non-technical. Um, you can get a, you can, you can accomplish a lot. Yeah. The business model. Thank you for that, Truman. Um, yeah. So I would say another thing to think about, uh, that I think about quite a bit, is uh, just commercial open source solutions, and particularly the space I've been talking about is. Um, uh, the, the, the supply chain issue uh, in, in, in scope three. Um, if, if you can bring the, the for in our case, the, the data of emissions that's embodied in a supply chain, there's uh, a lot of commercial applications, a lot of, that, that can use that data and bring value to the system. And it's okay if they make money doing it using open source code. It's, it's, it, that's the point. Uh, they they bring their own value to it. They help build the system. They help attract um, a, a additional data, additional participation, um, and are able to bring their their value chain into the digital world. That's the goal. Um, so yeah, I think that open source has its place, um, but in order to scale it, it needs to have um, a, kind of a self-replicated um, symbiotic relationship with the commercial world. Yeah. I think there's an interesting um, thought there because I think what you're alluding to is the code itself is valuable, but you need to be able to translate it into the application, uh, and that service is is it needs to be a commercial service. Yeah. If we open source Windows, which everyone knows, tomorrow, and I give you the code of Windows, and you're going to implement it in your company, good luck. <laughs> like it, it. it you're going to have a nightmare, right? So someone has to help you turn that, that code into a practical sense. That's sort of what you're alluding yeah, to, right? Yeah, that's yeah, great, great uh, um, allegory. And actually, maybe while we're already at uh, scope three, I mean, in our work or my work where I'm especially involved in, uh, I mean, we are talking more scope three downstream, so really towards the end user. And I mean, one of the big challenges that we have there actually to educate uh, consumers like uh, with, with climate and nature topics is that uh, how do you link it to the everyday actions transactions and i mean th that is really commodity business and that is something like where everyone would be better off actually to collaborate on on getting like once like a big inventory and mapping uh, on yeah, whether it's on the uh, payment transactions for example uh yeah on the on the carbon footprints and then you build actually the uh, the applications on top or the commercial use cases. So. I want to offer a, um, a counter counterpoint, different point of view on um, you know at least how some open source uh, projects can um, uh, straddle the the commercial um, and be you know sort of containerized things that can be then you know uh, used in proprietary solutions um, that can be commercialized. Um, that that uh, a, for example, a, an advisory services provider can can take and customize, customize, customize across a whole range of clients. Uh, but then also for public use cases, in some in some instances, um, there's going to be a value in, for example, um, you can't see him, but our our colleague uh, Matt Sando from BNP Paribas is here. Matt leads the Physical Risk and Resilience Project of OS Climate, um, and um, and, and we are intending within uh, the, the platform to develop a tool um, that uh, can be accessed, including as a web-based tool, uh, by um, a range of different users um, uh, that um, uh, may not be able to afford a commercial solution. So we want this to be available to communities, to uh, you know, small regional banks, to um, 
uh, a, a range of, of different institutions that are looking to understand vulnerability, understand what they need to do to mitigate that and, and to uh, plan investments in, in resilience um, and, uh, and, you know, to make sure it's essentially an appropriate technology, right? One that, um, that you don't need to be a rocket scientist, you don't need to, um, to have somebody intervening to help you to, to use. And so, you know, that's not easy to do. Um, it's not going to be done overnight, but it'll be done, you know, uh, we, we hope in collaboration with um, some of the best uh, and most experienced uh, people in doing that at the international institutions who have been trying to, you know, it's kind of, it's almost analogous to downscaling, right? From downscaling to a, you know, a, a simple usable solution. Um, so um, this isn't, this isn't competing with anyone. That kind of a public good uh, is not off-putting to a commercial provider uh, because, you know, it, indeed, there's still going to be a whole raft of different users that are still going to, you know, they'll, they'll be able to look and they'll be able to understand their vulnerability. But when it comes to planning, um, you know, a resilience investment that serves the community for the infrastructure for that community, whatever it is, they're still going to turn to international institutions, to NGOs, et cetera, um, who can make use of that information. So, you know, I think it is possible to straddle both, um, although, you know, ultimately, uh, the great power of what we do in, in OS Climate is going to be um, by the sort of the magnification and extension um, through commercial applications that use it. Um, from I liked what you're saying around the public good um, point. I mean, as a government, we're not really looking at this as a, from a from a commercial perspective. It's more, you know, we're building public infrastructure in the same way that we would be building highways. Um, and we're thinking of it in that way. We're also thinking about it, um, and this comes back to the open source question around enabling, empowering citizens, businesses in our jurisdiction to be able to share information in a way that is trusted, in a way that's efficient. Um, and also that sort of, we see what we're building as, as enabling the BC government to participate in an ecosystem uh, that's much broader than, than ourselves. Um, and so the open source, the use of open source, contributing to open source, that uh, improves the chances that what we're building is going to be interoperable with other systems. Um, it also opens us up to uh, a, like a really broad group of stakeholders uh, and like-minded individuals. So I would say that for us, it's, it's as much about uh, monetizing or, or uh, like a, having a, a business model. It's more about the value creation um, and uh, finding like-minded partners, such as Open Earth Foundation, uh, and um, and also uh, it, the value as well that we find is that when you're working in the open source community, you immediately weed out uh, the folks who aren't wanting to or aren't contributing code, the folks that aren't wanting to contribute effort. You know, to, to all of the different, you know, because it is it is a huge effort, not just the technical build, but also creating the governance around the use cases, uh, defining what is on the digital credentials, um, and, and then all the stakeholder relationship building that goes into it as well. So, and maybe uh, I mean I would imagine, for example, in the governmental context, that once you build a certain infrastructure or let's say like any communal management system. I mean, it's anyway sunk costs for you, so and there's not necessarily like a the the big benefit of like selling it to someone else. Or I mean, selling always is also an effort, yeah. but open sourcing it uh, in that moment can also mean that uh, you have the benefit of someone else continuing the development. And for example, for the for the for the further development, your costs will be significantly lower. So I think that's yeah, absolutely. Um, I did want to point out that uh, two of our um, panelists that uh, arrived later, Catherine Foster from GDFA and Louisa Durkin, uh, also from Open Earth, uh, open, opening the floor to whenever you want to chime in on, on the topic or if you want to talk a bit about Climate Action Data 2.0 community. Um, a lot of these things come up in the communities that we set up. What's the business model for these things? And I think that we've already heard a couple um, and, and even maybe True one. There's a, there's another one that's very important to Linux, which is like members. Members pay a fee, and they're part of the process. That is also a business model. 
uh, turning open source through services is another which you mentioned. And as you were talking about like the highway, like we build highways, we're the government. I haven't, I've never thought of the concept of like this government with taxpayer money made this highway that was actually used by another state. No, yeah. but with code, you do that, right? Like you put those taxpayer monies for your citizens and actually help citizens somewhere else. I got a great one on members. So we'll, we'll channel our, our dear colleague, Michael Tienan, uh, who started the world's first open source software company and is uh, part of the OS climate team. He says, um, so if you got 10 members, right? And they, they come to the open source project, it's like a bank. And, and it's one where uh, they come and they make a deposit. And the next one comes and makes a deposit. The next one comes and makes it a deposit. Um, uh, but that um, instead of just getting the return on your one account, right? Everyone gets a return for all 10 accounts. Yeah. So it's a great magnification of value. Um, uh, I mean, in the case of, of, um, of though, that's not enough money to get done what we need to get done. Uh, so we need philanthropic dollars as well um, to be able to add additional contract developers to fill gaps. Um, uh, Jim Whitehurst, uh, who I think is well known to all from you know leading Red Hat for for many years, um, contributed uh, some of the first philanthropic funding to OS Climate and uh, and 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 plus that up by a half million dollars this year. Uh, and um, you know that's been invaluable. Uh, so um, you know I think. Um, uh, philanthropic foundations, governmental foundations, the European Climate Foundation, etc., um, are important um, uh, uh, business model partners for a lot of these initiatives. Uh, you mentioned Brian Bailendorf. He's been terrific at channeling in and putting to work public sector dollars for creating these public goods. And the, the role of philanthropy is very interesting because when we think about investing investors always want to see that 10x return, right? And so it connects with the two things that you said. If I'm a philanthropist and I'm, and I'm supporting uh, with 100 units of value for this project, if it's open source and it actually creates a community, it leverages 1,000, right? And I think that's a very important as like the role of open source as a business model for other type of actions, like as a business model for philanthropy impact. Um, I think it's it, it, it very interesting to talk go back into like climate action and how to ground that. Um, it's it's worth remembering that when we think about climate action on the ground and like concept of 1.5, reducing emissions, um, deploying renewables, nature-based solutions, none of them are code, right? They're actions, um, but it's it's our collective ability to um, understand how that is happening, where are the opportunities, how do we manage by measuring, um, how do we remove frictions in the process of identifying, financing, deploying it, accounting for it, reporting it. Um, I think that's, that's to me where, where, where this, this fits. And from uh, Open Earth, tomorrow at, at 11 a.m. actually at the UNFCC Global Innovation Hub, we're launching an initiative that we started like three years ago called Open Climate, and it's around how, among other things, nesting uh, information about individuals, corporates, cities, subnationals, national, um, and that is we we see it as a as an open source process because it requires spatializing the information. Uh, understanding things in the context of jurisdictions and um, and sometimes it could be as simple as a standard and a protocol to really power something huge. The internet is the best example. Everyone knows HTTP because you put it ahead of every www uh, URL. It's, it's like it's a hypertext transfer protocol. Just the fact that we use that protocol empowers so much. Did the it, it's an intangible thing that not doesn't not everyone has to understand, but is operating in the background. And I think that's that's really worth um, worth sharing. Uh, be great to to hear more about other concrete like roles where this it really can empower climate action. Uh, I was actually even just thinking when you said, I mean, certain things are not software, but I mean, uh, hardly anything in in the current world runs without the help of software at least. So meaning that even if as a government, for example, you're looking at how to roll out certain infrastructure or whether it's energy infrastructure at scale. I mean, there's certain knowledge and there's the planning and scheduling and software involved. 
And so this is something that actually, yeah, if you open source it, it's not necessarily making someone else outcompete you, but it's uh, basically, yeah, helping reduce also the pain that anyway, because the climate is not uh, bound to uh, to borders of countries, so anyone anyone is benefiting from it. Yeah, so. That's true. Nancy, do you want to share a bit more about the, the BC? Because I know we have a video coming up uh, to talk about it. And um, yeah, I think it's, uh, we've got like NGOs, communities of practice, and like having government is, is, is super, super useful. And even going back to the architecture, the government is like a use, has a use case and says, this is what we need. Um, but it'd be, it'd be great to hear what's, what's been your, your process on understanding the, the role from government into deriving climate action. Yeah, I think the um, the climate action use cases are really interesting um, in terms of what the distributed ledger technology and digital credential uh, solution can do. Um, it, you know, there's the ability for uh, transparency, um, and then at the same time, the ability for privacy. I think are really uh, key aspects of this te technology for us. Um, the fact that when a credential is produced and transferred uh, from a, an issuer to a holder to a verifier, those transactions are recorded and they're immutable. And yet the information that's included on the credential is entirely private and enables self-sovereign uh, so sovereignty of data for the holder of that data. Um, so those two things together are really exciting in terms of possibilities for carbon accounting, uh, for... Um, you know, uh, mapping of carbon emissions from large emitters. Uh, you know, so we have uh, lots of legislation in BC around methane emissions for our natural gas producers. Uh, for large emitters, uh, they have to report their um, their GHGs annually to the government. Um, those are both um, processes that can be mapped using digital credentials, and. In fact, the, the, the technology can enable even better reporting. Like at the moment, the reporting that we do is uh, it's self-reported data that is then audited by um, a, you know, big auditing companies like, like PwC. Um, and, and, so that is, and then that is submitted to the government annually. Um, now we're thinking about for uh, methane emissions, um, having IoT devices, right? on the uh, natural gas uh, equipment that can measure potential um, methane leakages. And then also having data from um, satellites uh, overhead. So this data is being, it's, it's being produced. Um, we have the, the technology now to uh, exchange it in a way that is, uh, you know, it it's makes it more efficient, it, it makes it um, more verified. Uh, so. I think it's really an exciting, and I think also it's going to drive, the technology is, is getting to a point where it's going to drive policy, it's going to drive regulation, because we have regulation where, you know, companies are needing to submit this information, if they can do it in a way that's more efficient using, uh, it, you know, certain technology, digital credential technology, distributed ledgers, um, that's actually going to encourage better behavior and better reporting. So a quick one um, here is uh, it maybe gets a little bit back at the, the notion of the operating system um, for planet Earth, right? So one of the things that um, is the, sort of the big grand vision is um, having a true set of prices that are transmitted throughout the global economy so that, um, so that decisions are taken um, um, and transactions are taken on the basis of a true price. Um, uh, and so when you think about, uh, you know, policy is only, uh, only good if, it is, um, is it, if it's put into implementation in a way you could set a carbon price. But in, if, if the, 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 in, the, then the information about how um, um, assets or uh, how projects or whatever um, the, the the price of the carbon um, um, and and non-carbon that are associated with those things if those are not um, accurate and then accessible to the 
sectors of, uh, of, of finance and the civil society, are we for it or are we against it, right? Then, um, you know, that's when we actually have value. And, um, and that price discovery, I mean, we've seen this over and over and over again. Price discovery requires a, a community. It requires multiple stakeholders all looking and just de and determining yes that's trustworthy and 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 yes you know my view is the price is x my view is the price is y my view is the price is z and and then that emerges to sort of a consensus price that's acted upon i know that we are what do we see what do we see what do we see yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like I'm going to suggest that we um, have as our uh, kind of closing theme um, is uh, what are what do each of us see going forward? What should the viewers um, look at and watch for in in the next couple of years? That's it. That's a that's a great great idea. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to kick it off. And I also, if anyone in the audience wants to raise your hand with questions, I think that's also fair game as well. Um, there's a couple of trends that, that we're seeing because the digital transformation has been, you know, like my entire life I've seen, I've been part of a digital transformation and yet I feel like we're still like scratching the surface. So more and more digital transformation is happening in the context of these macro trends like climate change, like energy transitions. And um, I think we're going to see more, more consortia of private public partnerships working together around the common digital highways we need to navigate these macro trends, transitions of energy, planetary scale, uh, management of emissions, mitigations, and um, we're going to see a lot, or let's say, I hope to see a lot more education to the different set of funders, philanthropy, government, startups, uh, funds themselves into the power of open source. It's not new, of course, because open source has been around for a while. Almost every computer in the world uses a Linux product. Um, but because it has such a critical role to the collective intelligence needed to avoid the existential crisis we face today, such as, the, such as climate and biodiversity, it's not just about it will run your computer better. No, it will be a source for us to operationalize reactions uh, collectively that are not just necessary to survive, but to thrive. Um, so I, I think that's, that's really what I, why we, we, we moved into this space so, so clearly because I have a hard time, even, so, even though it seems such a technocratic vision that we're like, how do we save Earth? And like, well, it's open source. Well, it's the collaboration that needs to happen um, because in the process of doing that, we realize that we're all stakeholders of that thing that we're collectively building and we can expand our notion of like where I start and you begin so that we move from the me to we, which is the expansion of consciousness that we also need to deal with climate and biodiversity crises. So I actually think that, that perhaps through, through open source, there's a, there's a way that we can actually change our, our social mindset. Actually, Thank you. Um, my name's Claire Malamed. I'm the CEO of an organization called the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. And our focus really is on closing the gap between solutions, whether they be open source or proprietary, and the sort of data technologies that can help provide that sort of 3D up-to-date view of the planet that you've all been talking about. And those governments, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of Latin America, where they most urgently need those solutions, but also where there are really significant barriers to adoption and really significant barriers to them being able to, to actually use the data and the technologies that are available to improve their policy making, to improve the predict their predictive capacity, 
to anticipate shocks and so on. And I think, I mean, this is, you know, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. I think there were a couple of things that we see consistently as barriers to adopting, particularly on the kind of digital public goods, open, open source side. None of them are actually within the scope of the open source community. So we're talking kind of even bigger partnerships and even more ambitious goals. But, uh, but one is some really basic infrastructure challenges that we often kind of wish away, I think, in this community and kind of ignore, you know, there are basic connectivity challenges, challenges of access to the infrastructure, the actual laptops that you need the, with the, the size of laptop that you need to be able to run some of these technologies and so on. So I think there's some quite basic infrastructure challenges that as I say, are kind of out of scope, but nonetheless are a barrier to accessing this technology. A second thing, I think, which has been a bit of a, which has caused the, a lot of challenges, I think, in countries that have tried to implement ambitious digital public goods or digital systems around digital ID and so on, is around data governance and management. Ultimately, public consent for digital public goods relies on the public having the confidence that the data on which these systems run is going to be managed effectively, that they can hold somebody accountable for its use and misuse. And often that is an afterthought in the design of these systems and something which has, as I say, been a political barrier to implementation. So I think there are a few things that are understanding that they're out of scope of all of you on this platform, but nonetheless, if we are ambitious and hopeful about this technology, somebody needs to be thinking about these things if the technology is to get to some of the places where it's needed the most. Thanks. Yeah, no, great. I think everything you mentioned actually is part of the scope, like digital governance and trust. And, and I think you, you touch on a very important point that we mentioned at the beginning is um, how do we also, how does this also part of help bridge an equity gap? in terms of access, in terms of capacity building, and there's a lot of things that are still needed, which is, which is, which is quite key. Uh, over to anyone else that wants to share. Um, yeah, I just quickly close with, uh, uh, I like the way you said the, the gap. I would say a closing of the gap. So whether you're talking about, you know, cross-chain cross -chain functionality, whether you're talking about you know closing the gap with standards um, in how you know data is measured, captured, how you know emissions is is measured, um, I think that there's obviously a, a need and a general momentum in in, in all the different stakeholder groups and everybody in their specific area of expertise. Those are the conversations that I'm hearing right now, um, and so uh, has to be done, will be done. Um, that that's what I think we'll see. Um, maybe for me, just a thought about, uh, I mean, open source is something very much about culture, I mean, the tech community, um, but I think it also somehow resembles very well what's, what's for example, happening now more on the uh, yeah, consumer end, I mean, like with the sharing economy, I mean, it's less about ownership, it's more about access, and I think that is probably also something that uh, with that spreading more and more, uh, you have actually more convergence between the back end and the front end, so hoping that that will also help accelerate. I think um, this is a little parochial to OS Climate, but I hope that it's true across all of our projects is, you know, when um, when I was figuring out, um, um, first, I started, I, I tried OS Climate out as a fintech, and it was hard, man. We ran, and it ran smack into the wall of some big incumbents that totally shut us down. Uh, so, uh, but one of the things that was apparent was that each of those were developing substandard solutions because they were just doing them, you know, one company providing them to a whole bunch of customers. Um, and um, when I, I turned to, to Jim Whitehurst and um, Jim Zemlin and others to sort of figure out, you know, what, what, whether we could solve, whether we could solve what I wanted to solve, um, through open source, you know, one of the things that um, um, that Jim Whitehurst said, talk to Jim Zemlin and, and ask how many people have been involved in the developing of the Linux operating system. 
and the other projects across the LF, it's 540,000 people, right? And so I think that's <clears throat> that's one of the things that I <clears throat> see in the trend in the in the, the the year and two ahead is going out from smaller communities that are working on these things where you have you know dozens or some hundreds that are that are contributing code uh, to ones where we have thousands and tens of thousands bringing pieces of the code bringing some of the data um, and and that's when we really scale these solutions Um, well, just that I thank you. I, those are really good comments. I think from a government perspective, um, the equity considerations are huge. Um, I'm not, I'm a much, I'm on the policy and strategy side of things, not the technical side of things. So I often describe open source as um, that we are uh, putting together a cake recipe that we're putting out, out there. And I mean, but can build it and make a cake. Uh, if they want to from it, but if you don't have the ingredients, if you don't have the access, then yeah, that is those are really important considerations, especially um, access to you know computers, access to the to uh, smartphones, um, and even connectivity uh, to the internet. I think those are really th those are really important considerations for our, for our project. Um, I'd also, if, if we have time, it would be great to, I have a video yeah. we can play, which is around uh, interoperability um, and just sort of shows the, 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 the power of, um, of collaborating through the open source community. Uh, we have a number of different wallet providers that we work with um, and uh, we've been able to do a, a use case with uh, mining uh, emissions data. Uh, that uh, we can showcase um, uh, the, the, the use of uh, digital credentials to pass along information. Great. Um, let's watch the video because I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to see the, that, that perspective and, and a lot of this into action. Uh, Slap for it. Um, and yep, there it is. Prosperity and Partners are presenting the Energy and Mines Digital Trust Ecosystem. The ecosystem consists of mining corporations, the British Columbia government, third parties and auditors, as well as verifiers, such as car manufacturers. In our example, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation is using the Sferity Digital Product Passport solution to request, hold and present their company credentials. In this video, we're showing a hypothetical use case in which the British Columbia government uses the traction technology to issue registration credentials and the auditor PricewaterhouseCoopers uses Northern Block Orbit to issue greenhouse gas emissions reports. Finally, an example original equipment manufacturer, or OEM, uses Spirity's solution to validate credentials and to keep an audit log of their compliance checks. As all solutions are interoperable, the partners create an ecosystem to exchange greenhouse gas emissions reports in a secure and verifiable way. The intent of the video is to show that all the wallets can exchange real verified data about a BC mining company's business registration and annual GHG report. To sell in international markets, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation needs to prove that they are a registered mine and need to make available its greenhouse gas emissions report. The Energy and Mines Digital Trust ecosystem offers an easy and trustworthy way to do this. To establish initial trust, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation requests a registration credential from the BC Government Registration Services Traction Digital Wallet. They use their Sparity Digital Product Passport solution to walk through the application form and then send a registration request to the BC government wallet. After clicking request, a registration request is sent to the BC government. BC government's traction wallet is validating the proposal to then issue the registration credential to Copper Mountain Mining Corporation. When the registration credential has been issued, a notification is sent to Copper Mountain Mining Corporation to accept or reject the credential. Once it's accepted, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation is a registered service with the BC government and can also prove so to third parties. As a next step, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation needs to request the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report, which is issued to them by PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, using the interoperable Northern Block wallet. 
Before that PwC audited Copper Mountain Mining Corporation according to their standards. To receive the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation needs to again request the credential using the Sperity Digital Product Passport Solution. They fill out the dedicated form for this credential type and then send the request to PwC. Once the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report has been sent to Copper Mountain, they again receive a notification and can accept or reject the credential. After the second credential is stored in Copper Mountain's wallet, any industry partner can check that the mining corporation is a registered company and has a valid greenhouse gas emissions report. Let's put ourselves in the role of an automotive OEM who wants to buy raw materials from Copper Mountain and thus check their regulatory compliance. For this, the OEM enters the decentralized identifier of Copper Mountain to contact their organizational wallet and request that Copper Mountain provide proof of their business registration and annual GHG emissions. Once Copper Mountain has accepted the proof request, the OEM can verify that Copper Mountain hold a business registration credential of the BC government and a greenhouse gas emissions report credential of PwC. The OEM has proof that the credentials were issued by the correct wallets, and have not been tampered with or revoked, they also have access to any data held within the credential that Copper Mountain chooses to share. With this, the OEM can verify that Copper Mountain is a registered business in the jurisdiction in which it operates. Again? Again? Okay, it's a wrap. Amazing. Wow. That's a, that's a big journey. Uh, all open source journey. That, that really, uh, wow. Well, um, they all interrupt. Sorry. Right, I was just say that's just one of your use cases. I mean, you know, whether it's ag, whether it's, um, you know, you know, sort of any commodity that's running through the economy, um, you know, and ending up, uh, you know, in this case, it's an OEM that's buying. You talked about consumer goods. Um, you know, that uh, th 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 what, what you build here is extensible, really, to all those different environments, all those different value chains. I love it. I think that's the power of the, ar the right architecture, right? If you have the right architecture, modular, these Lego blocks allow us to apply it to different things um, and then replicate it. And then you put it out and you wait for the community to also come up with all kinds of things that you didn't think about. Right. And say, I'm raising my hand. I'm going to do the next one, right? And, yeah. And, and build the community around And to say, right, so someone then says, okay, I see it. I see the need. Um, I'm going to be the one that builds the... Um, the ag version of what BC has built for metals and mining. I'm going to build the community around that. I'm going to bring in and attract the IP, attract the developers, and make it happen. So that's what's possible based on what you all have built. It's beautiful. And I think part of the trends that we're talking about, that, that private-public relationship on the open source rails is, is definitely key. Um, maybe one last word for me is on the, on the trends is, uh, youth engagement, because getting getting a lot of people involved is is a way of like all having a role in accountability around climate and um, and empowering a, 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 that, um, and they understand the technology a lot more than, than everyone else, uh, for sure. Um, if we don't have any closing remarks, I think it would be great to. Um, yeah, appreciate uh, the, all the different angles that, that we, we participate here. We also have, I don't know if you want to do some open uh, closing remarks uh, as our great host. Um, no, okay, thank you. It was very inspiring. And we are always happy to have such bright and cooperative people in our digital innovation pavilion. And together we are strong. So we're strong. Open source. Thank you. We'll put out our video afterwards as well.